Hey, so here's your first uh, slide in our lecture on scientific investigation, and it has to do with how we as scientists, during a scientific investigation, gather evidence. So really we're going to be talking about two different things in this slide right here, using this graphic that you see. We're going to be talking about the difference between an observation and an inference. So an observation is simply uh, information that you collect uh, about the world around you, about your environment, using one of your five senses. So sight, touch, taste, uh, uh, sound, and what am I missing? Smell. Um, in this case, we're using our sight because we have a picture to look at. So you could observe several different things about, about this picture. And if I gave you a couple seconds, I bet you could come up with a few on your own. You might observe, for instance, that there are two sets of tracks. We have our pink set of tracks and we have our blue set of tracks. You may observe that it looks like the uh, whatever leaves the blue set of tracks could have a longer step because there are some areas where the tracks are further apart whereas the, uh, the purple tracks are not so spaced apart. You could observe that clearly whatever left this set of tracks and this set of tracks met here in the middle. Okay. You could observe all types of different things using just your, your uh, sight. Okay. There is a difference, however, between that and then drawing an inference. An inference is uh, a suggestion of something that could have occurred or will occur based upon um, your background knowledge or prior experiences. Okay. So while you might observe that these tracks are closer together whereas these are further apart or that they're pink versus blue or that they come together in the middle and only one set of tracks comes out the other side, your inference about the situation might be different. Okay. So a logical inference could be it looks like there was an organism moving up into this frame. There is an organism moving down into the frame. The two organisms one came out the other side. So you could possibly infer, and it would be logical, that maybe this was a predator-prey type situation where we had maybe a fox and I don't know what that might be, a, a, a rabbit? A, not sure what that is, but uh, a rabbit moving in the same direction. They met each other, kind of some type of scuffle ensued, and then the fox trotted away with, the, uh, with its prey caught in its mouth. That's a logical inference, but did anyone go this direction? Did anyone think that a logical inference would be that there was an uh, uh, organism riding on top of the other organism? So as these two organisms met in the middle uh, and they kind of uh, danced around and kind of made this whole mess right here, did anyone infer that the only reason we see one set of tracks out the other side is because all the organisms climbed on the back of another organism? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. The point here, guys, is that observation is something that you can uh, uh, observe based on your five senses. Okay? It's, it's information you can collect based on your five senses, whereas an inference is a logical conclusion you can make based on prior knowledge or based on past experiences. And the last portion of this lecture is going to be about experimental design. And this is what we call a, a diagram of, of the scientific method. So uh, we're going to be talking here about how you actually use observations uh, and inferences scientifically to set up a valid scientific investigation, to set up a valid scientific experiment. So this kind of goes in a stepwide process. And we're going to start over here with, uh, with what we consider the first step of the scientific method and that's to make an observation and guys the best scientists in the world and in history have been phenomenal observers of their environments they don't take any observation too lightly they ask tons of questions but they're just out there collecting information wondering about the world around them okay all of that wondering and all of those observations then lead to kind of this second step of the scientific method where hopefully you're not just observing things but you're actually asking why you're observing them where they're coming from why a certain event is taking place asking questions makes a fantastic scientist in fact i talk all the time about how science is less about finding answers and more about asking questions okay once you have a question in mind that you would like to find an answer to the third step over here is forming what we call a hypothesis. Now a hypothesis a lot of people will say is an educated guess and I don't like that so much. A hypothesis is more about um, a prediction, a proposed solution to your question or to your problem 
but kind of like an inference, it's based upon uh, your previous experiences or your prior knowledge. It's not just a random guess. It's a, it's a conclusion that you think may occur based on some sound reasoning. Once you have a hypothesis in place, and a hypothesis that will lead to a, a valid scientific uh, investigation and something that you can actually test, then here we go. You are ready for step four, which actually is testing that hypothesis. Okay. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about various uh, uh, factors to keep in mind when you're testing a hypothesis. Um, and that essentially, guys, this step right here is a scientific experiment. This is your experimentation process. Testing your hypothesis is actually conducting, executing, performing your experimentation. Okay. As you go through that experiment, hopefully you're collecting uh, data, and there are two types of data, two types of information, and we'll talk about them uh, in, a, in another slide here in a second. But as you collect your information, as you collect your observations, as you collect your data, you're preparing yourself over here for step five analyzation of that data, analyzing your results. This is where you actually take a look at all of your numbers, take a look at all of your observations, and try to start making sense of them so that you can go back and hopefully answer your original hypothesis. Once you've analyzed your data, you do need to draw a conclusion. So that's down here, step six. Once you have all of your data kind of laid out in front of you, you had a chance to digest it and look it over, you have to make some type of conclusion. But please keep in mind, the conclusion does not need to support your initial hypothesis. Remember, your hypothesis was based on uh, uh, sound reasoning, uh, past experiences, or prior knowledge. Okay? That doesn't necessarily mean you have to prove your hypothesis correct. In fact, your data could show one of two things. Your data could show that your hypothesis was in fact not supported. And maybe you have to rethink things. Or your data could show that your hypothesis was in fact supported. And either one is a valid scientific outcome. We should not be afraid of disproving or not supporting our hypothesis and supporting our hypothesis. Either one of those outcomes is totally fine within the scientific community. What people will say is incredibly important, and this is this last step over here, number seven, is how you communicate those results. You need to make sure that you do a fantastic job, not only with these first you know, steps here, one, your observation that led to a question and your hypothesis. You need to make sure that your test is valid, that you set up a great uh, experimentation protocol. You need to make sure that uh, you have done a good job collecting and analyzing all of your data. You need to make sure that you have drawn the appropriate conclusions, but it doesn't mean anything if you do those six steps without finally being able to communicate your results to the rest of the world. Okay. So this is what we call the scientific method. And notice I took kind of this route in this direction. Oops. Right back here. This direction. But there's all these other arrows that kind of point to different directions as well. The scientific method is not a set in stone process. It's not a recipe like from a cookbook. In fact, there's these other kind of side channels that you can get into. And it's a very fluid process. Okay. We like to go in this kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven order, but it doesn't always have to be that way. And you'll learn that as we go further through the course this year. So now I wanted to talk just a little bit more about, uh, if we go back for a second, about step four, okay, about testing our hypothesis, conducting an experimentation. I want to talk more about that in these next few, few slides. So in this slide, I want to talk to you about two different types of data that you can collect. Okay, we call one type of data qualitative data. And qualitative data is data that is based on observing characteristics of whatever your test subjects may be. Okay? Qualitative data, like the quality of something, you are looking for its quality, you are looking for its characteristics. So in this case, some examples of qualitative data, if we're looking at just this, the lawn, so ignore like the fence and the trees and all that stuff in the background, let's just focus on the grass. Okay? Qualitatively, you could say, man, over here I have a dead spot, whereas here I have a, a living spot. Here I have good grass. You could say here the grass is brown, whereas over here the grass is green. Okay? Those are examples of qualitative observations. They're simply describing the quality or the characteristics of your test subjects, okay, whether dead or alive or brown or green, those are characteristics. 
On the other hand, we have a, another type of data called quantitative data. Quantitative like quantity. Now quantity suggests that there's some type of number. And quantitative data is data that we measure, that we can associate a number with. Okay? So maybe a, a piece of quantitative data we could draw from this picture is how tall is this grass versus how tall is this grass. Okay? Another piece of quantitative data we could collect is the area. We could measure this whole area. What is the area of this dead patch? And what is the area of this dead patch over here? Okay? Things like height, things like area, those all have numbers and measurements associated with them. Therefore, they are quantitative pieces of information, quantitative data. In this slide, I want to show you the uh, difference between another uh, set of important factors in a scientific investigation, what we call the independent and the dependent variable. Sometimes the independent variable is called the manipulated variable. And sometimes the dependent variable is called the responding. So whether we say independent and dependent or manipulated and responding, we mean the same thing. Okay? The independent variable, guys, is something that you, as the experimenter, have the ability to change on purpose. It's what you are changing on purpose. In this case, if this was an experiment about whether the shoes that you're wearing affect how high you can jump, then shoes, or the type of shoes, are the independent variable. That is something that this guy, if he's the experimenter, he is changing, and he's changing on purpose. So it's the independent variable. Okay how high he is able to jump as a result, that would be considered the dependent or the responding variable. Okay? That information depends upon, at least in his mind, that factor that he manipulated. So he manipulates his shoes, that makes them independent, and he measures how high he can jump as a result. The independent or the manipulated is what we change, and the dependent or the responding is what we measure as a result of that change. And the last slide here, I want to talk about the importance of having what we call control groups and experimental groups, but we can also wrap up kind of everything that we've learned about scientific investigation in this slide. Here we're testing to see if different conditions affect how moldy bread can become. Kind of gross, I know. But Take a look. So first of all, we can have quantitative data and we can have qualitative data. Our qualitative data is just describing characteristics. So we could describe the color of the molds. We could describe its location. We could describe the texture of the bread. We could describe if it had any type of smell. Uh, maybe not the taste. That might not be the best qualitative data to collect in this project. But those characteristics are qualitative data. Quantitatively, again, we could measure the area of mold that we see. We could measure the number of mold colonies that are growing. Maybe we could measure the width of the widest mold colony. Anything we can measure is quantitative data. Okay? At the same time, there is an independent and a dependent variable. The independent variable, the thing that this experimenter cha uh, changed, is the condition of their hands. Right? So they had clean hands when they touched this bread, and they had dirty hands when they touched this bread. That's what they changed. The dependent variable then would be what they measured. And again, that would be the presence or the amount, the quantity of mold. That's what they measured. Therefore, that is the dependent variable. Okay? But the last thing we haven't talked about yet is this idea that we have to have what is called a control. And these two pieces of bread over here would be not control. They would be what we call experimental. In a good scientific investigation, you have to have some test subject or group of test subjects that receives normal conditions, that doesn't get any special treatment. It's just treated the same as it always would be. That is called the control. Okay? It's treated exactly as it always would be. So maybe they slid this piece of bread into that plastic baggie without even letting their hands come in contact. Okay. Over here, then, we have two pieces of bread that are part of what we call the experimental group, not the control group, the experimental group. And they're experimental because they received the testing conditions of being touched by clean hands and being touched by dirty hands. So that's the scientific method in scientific investigation wrapped up in a nutshell.